When I first left the Jehovah's Witnesses, my story was not unlike many. If you've spent a bit of time in the XJW community, you'll notice a particular author and book referenced over and over again. That book is 1984 by George Orwell. When I left, this book and Orwell's Animal Farm too, were among the first things I read. Why is this such an important piece of literature to JW Exeteers? That's what I'd love to talk about today. And for those of you who've read 1984, I'm not sure if this is my own reflection or just the utter genius of George Orwell, but there's actually two ways of reading this book. Most who read 1984 interpret it first and foremost as a tragedy. Hell, my first reading of it was quite difficult. But it wasn't until I reread it that I fundamentally saw this story about Winston Smith as a comedy. Those infamous final words of the book, in fact, hold within them the entire point of my channel, that being the law of attraction. But how? How in the world could 1984 be read as anything but the darkest that literature has on offer? Stick around and you'll see. Hey good people, I'm Derek London. Thanks for checking out my channel. Around here we talk about everything law of attraction. We discuss a lot about the psychological, scientific, and rational basis for subscribing to this philosophy of mine. And in fact, if your reality could stand some change for the better, you have only to start there, with your mind. Hit that subscribe button and settle in, because your life will never be the same. Hey everyone, thanks as always for stopping by. Let's just start with a short synopsis of the story so I don't end up losing those who've not read the book. Sparknotes.com had a pretty decent summary I'll quote from, and then we'll make a connection to the Jehovah's Witnesses and different interpretations of Orwell. Here's what that website has to say. Winston Smith is a low-ranking member of the ruling party in London, in the nation of Oceania. Everywhere Winston goes, even his own home, the party watches him through telescreens. Everywhere he looks, he sees the face of the party's seemingly omniscient leader a figure known only as Big Brother. The party controls everything in Oceania, even the people's history and language. Currently, the party is forcing the implementation of an invented language called Newspeak, which attempts to prevent political rebellion by eliminating all words related to it. Even thinking rebellious thoughts is illegal. As the novel opens, Winston feels frustrated by the oppression and rigid control of the party which prohibits free thought, sex, and any expression of individuality. Winston dislikes the party and has illegally purchased a diary in which to write his criminal thoughts. He has also become fixated on a powerful party member named O'Brien, whom Winston believes is a secret member of the Brotherhood, the mysterious legendary group that works to overthrow the party. Winston works in the Ministry of Truth where he alters historical records to fit the needs of the party. He notices a co-worker, a beautiful dark-haired girl, staring at him and worries that she's an informant who will turn him in for his thought crime. Winston spends his evenings wandering through the poorest neighborhoods in London where the proletarians, or proles, live squalid lives relatively free of party monitoring. One day, Winston receives a note from the dark-haired girl that reads, I love you. She tells him her name, Julia, and they begin a covert affair. This relationship lasts for some time. Winston is sure that they will be caught and punished sooner or later, while Julia is more pragmatic and optimistic. As Winston's affair with Julia progresses, his hatred for the party grows more and more intense. At last, he receives the message that he has been waiting for. O'Brien wants to see him. O'Brien confirms to Winston and Julia that, like them, he hates the party and says that he works against it as a member of the Brotherhood. He indoctrinates Winston and Julia into the Brotherhood. So Winston reads the propaganda to Julia in their private room above a store. Suddenly, soldiers barge in and seize them. The proprietor of the store is revealed as having been a member of the Thought Police all along. Torn away from Julia and taken to a place called the Ministry of Love, Winston finds that O'Brien, too, is a party spy who simply pretended to be a member of the Brotherhood in order to trap Winston into committing an open act of rebellion against the party. 
O'Brien spends months torturing and brainwashing Winston, his struggles to resist. At last, O'Brien sends him to the dreaded room 101, the final destination for anyone who opposes the party. Here, O'Brien tells Winston that he will be forced to confront his worst fear. Throughout the novel, Winston has had recurring nightmares about rats. O'Brien now straps a cage full of rats onto Winston's head and prepares to allow the rats to eat his face. Winston snaps, pleading with O'Brien to do it to Julia, not him. Giving up Julia is what O'Brien wanted from Winston all along. His spirit broken, Winston is released to the outside world. He meets Julia but no longer feels anything for her. He has accepted the party entirely." End quote. And these are the haunting closing lines of the book. O oh, cruel, needless misunderstanding! O oh, stubborn, self-willed exile from the loving breast! Two gin-scented tears trickled down the side of his nose. But it was all right. Everything was all right. The struggle was finished. He had won the victory over himself. He loves Big Brother. End quote. So there's the long and the short of it. It's a fantastic read. It's one of those books which is always of value to revisit. But why does this work speak so strongly to ex Jehovah's Witnesses? Well, the parallels are almost innumerable. First, there is the drab and parochial mental images. The lack of color in this world Orwell writes about is all too familiar to the former witness. In the novel, even the application of makeup by women was repressed. I remember how the book narrates Winston's reaction to Julia applying bootleg makeup to her face. And to me, this directly correlates to the excessive mediocrity, the idea that worship has to hurt, the emphasis on modesty, living simply, abandoning a life of greatness, the stifling of deep intellectual pursuits and art, all contribute to this malaise and grayness of being the model Jehovah's Witness. That's certainly what spoke to me. There's also the power of innuendo and subtlety in Jehovah's Witness parlance. It's like they have their own version of Newspeak. And when you're initiated, you know precisely what is meant by the terms loving discipline, loyalty, marked, the last days, apostate, Babylon the Great, the wild beast, or peace and security. We all know that despite the faithful and discreet slave being a class of anointed individuals, who shepherd God's flock and give spiritual food at the proper time, the practical meaning of this entity always refers to the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses. You see, it's stuff like that, just like the Ministry of Love and the Ministry of Peace in the book refer to law enforcement and the military arm of the party, so too shunning is replaced with loving discipline when there is simply nothing loving or conscionable about it. When you open your eyes to the Watchtower's annexation of its members' language, the ex-witness heaves at its dystopic Orwellian flavor. And then there's the perjuring of their immensely sordid history, i.e. their well-documented Masonic connections, their subliminal imaging, their investments, their failed eschatology, their complicity in child sexual abuse, and all the rest of it. These are all grotesque examples of the Ministry of Truth hard at work again. So those are just a few terse and triggering reasons Orwell is unspeakably profound to an XJW. But where's the light in all this? How on earth could this novel ever be construed as a comedy or happily ever after? Well that's where things get deeply troubling. This is kind of like that film Arlington Road or The Godfather where you're rooting for the antagonist. As a disclaimer, I'm not making a defense for totalitarianism, high control groups, dictatorships, or anything like that. Of course there are objectively cruel and wicked abuses of power. But the brilliance of Orwell is seen when Winston was seized and subjected to indoctrination and torture. Now listen to this interaction between Orwell and Winston. If you're a man, Winston, you are the last man. Your kind is extinct. We are the inheritors. Do you understand that you're alone? You're outside history. You're non-existent. His manner changed and he said more harshly, And you consider yourself morally superior to us with our lies and our cruelty? Yes, I consider myself superior. That's Winston. O'Brien did not speak. Two other voices were speaking. After a moment, Winston recognized one of them as his own. 
It was a soundtrack of the conversation he had had with O'Brien on the night when he had enrolled himself in the Brotherhood. He heard himself promising to lie, to steal, to forge, to murder, to encourage drug taking and prostitution, to disseminate venereal diseases, to throw vitriol in a child's face. O'Brien made a small impatient gesture as though to say that the de demonstration was hardly worth making. Then he turned to switch and the voices stopped. Not sure what happened with the light, but what's so troubling about Orwell is he righteously condemns totalitarianism, but admits through Winston that it's technically unavoidable depending on your perspective. If Winston, through the Brotherhood, could have effectively brought down the Ingsoc and realized his utopia, it necessarily would have involved the exact same corruptions and evils that were employed against him. And that's where Winston fully lost control over his perception on reality, to a point where he wasn't even sure about how many fingers O'Brien was holding up. So when you get to the end of the book, when Winston had finally been broken and forced to accept the party, it says he loves Big Brother. Where's the comedy in this? Well, the thing that Winston learned was that he was a hypocrite and that he wasn't cut out to live as a martyr. This interpretation that I'm putting forward is easily confused with pacifism or surrenderism, and I'd never qualify myself as such. But let me tell you, playing the martyr is no way to live. There are battles that are worth fighting, sure, but a Taoist acknowledgement for the necessity of your enemy and a rejection of your own righteousness gives you maximal freedom. Generally speaking, better it is to effect change or progress from within the matrix you're embedded than to die a revolutionary utopian who never finds enlightenment. There's other stuff I could say which connects so well to the law of attraction about perspective and how all you need to do is just change your angle and the world turns upside down. So that's an unorthodox reading of Orwell, which is perhaps more uplifting. And I think it's another moral from this book the next, that an ex-Jehovah's Witness can relate to as well. I've had numerous ex-witnesses remark on my channel that as upsetting as the Watchtower is, they've also discovered that defining your life by resistance results in a similar kind of unfreedom too. Find the center and try to at least set your tiny corner of the world right. It's not as glorious as going down in a hail of bullets with the name of the Almighty on your lips, but it's a more sustainable and worthwhile way of being. This is central to what the Law of Attraction teaches. Everyone knows that our free will in life is not absolute. I would never preach that. But if you're curious about what kind of things we can control, even in the most dire of situations, I produced a work entitled, Being Worthy of Our Sufferings. It'll be linked below in the description and in the end screen. Tell me what you think of all that below in the comments. We'll see you again hopefully very soon. Take care. Hey guys, did you like this video? You know what to do. And if something I mentioned today resonated with you, click one of them cards on this screen. I have lots of related content sure to interest you. Thanks as always for your views, and we'll see you next time.